Welcome to Best Practice, a show where we interview leaders in the building industry to unpack the tools, strategies, and tactics to run great organizations. Today, my colleague at Monograph, Chris, and myself are very pleased to welcome Nick Schiffer, owner and CEO of NS Builders, to talk about how to learn from construction. This is going to be a very special two-hour deep dive into running a construction firm focused on everything from high-quality details, lessons learned along the way from interviewing hundreds of, of contractors um, over his career. Nick founded NS Builders in 2014. He has carefully filled his team with other enthusiastic creatives driven by a collective passion for quality craftsmanship. Um, if you want to check out what that looks like, visit uh, nsbuilders.com. Uh, uh, it's pretty amazing uh, work. Um, it's, it's really beautiful. And he, they've grown into one of the most renowned home builders in the East Massachusetts area. Beyond Nick's regional practice, Nick is also a global resource to contractors, architects, and owners across the world through a very popular Instagram and YouTube channel where he shares detailed knowledge and processes during site visits and shop tours. Nick also co-hosts the incredible The Modern Craftsman podcast with two fellow contractors. Nick, super excited to have you. Join being us. part of this, man. Yeah, that was an awesome intro. Yeah, this is going to be fun. This is going to be very different. Um, Chris might want to kick us off a little bit for the conversation. Yeah, so Nick, I mean, uh, you cannot finish watching the content that Nick has produced. Uh, not only is there just so much, but it's constantly being added to. Um, so uh, there is a world of insight to discover about Nick, um, not only from his, not only what he does, but then the conversations he's has with other contractors is just incredibly impressive. We'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, but uh, I want to start off with a few different parts of your background that are really interesting. First, um, you used to just build sheds uh, on the weekends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's very true. But you also worked in high rise uh, for a high rise developer for mm -hmm. four years. Yep. And um, and you studied construction management as well. I think that there's also some background with you really young as a contractor and your it yes. was in your family. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, my father owned a um, well, my grandfather owned a fence company. Uh, it was a resident primarily residential fence company. He had this kind of. Uh, warehouse where he would store all the parts Had a couple of crews that would go out and install wood, wood, chain link, ornamental metal, uh, ornamental metal fence, guardrail, things of that nature. And um, early on, I was always, you know, even before uh, like under 10 years old, I was in my backyard building forts and building, you know, I think I half built a shed and then I turned it into a skate park ramp because I got into skate skating and, and biking and, and things like that. But when I was 11 years old, I had asked my dad if I could come uh, to work with him because I just, I wanted, I guess at the time, I just, I think I just wanted money. I didn't want anything else. I wanted to be able to buy things. Um, and I went into work and I would work, you know, whether it was a half day Saturday, uh, obviously I was in school or on the, in the summer I'd work five, five, six days a week. And, you know, my grandfather paid me, I think it was $15 a day. And I remember, I remember vividly being 11 years old and someone telling me that that wasn't even minimum wage. So I went into my grandfather's office and I, I said, Grampy, I want to raise and I want $5 an hour. And he told me to get the F out of his office. <laughs> and uh, he ended up giving me the raise later that day, only to find out that I still wasn't making minimum wage. And I had asked for another raise later on, but fast forward, I, I worked for I worked for that company. My dad ended up taking it over in 2001. Um, and I worked for that. I worked in that company for 11 years, uh, from the time I was 11 years old to the time I was 22. And, you know, it went from being a kid that swept the floors and packed the bins to ultimately I was at one point we were down on manpower and I was running the wood shop during the day and I was welding gates at night. So I kind of taught myself how to weld and just, and, and helping with customer service, whatever my dad needed, really. Uh, and I had a lot of fun doing it. And, and I, I went to school, I went to college for construction management. And my goal was to start my own company uh, doing carpentry, um, maybe a year, two years after I graduated. And two weeks after I graduated college, 
went back to work for my dad and my phone rang and I was standing in my dad's shop and this guy called and said, Hey, uh, I want to interview you. We have this opportunity in Boston, um, to, to work in high remodeling a high rise. And I was like, listen, I appreciate it. I'm all set. And I hung up. Uh, he called me back two weeks later and said, I completely understand where you're coming from. I know that you're working for your dad. You know, we had chatted obviously more and he's like, I just want to meet you and just want to show you kind of what I'm thinking. No, no pressure. You don't, you certainly don't have to take the job. I just would like to meet you. And, um, I, I guess I'm going down a, a rabbit hole here, but I remember I took the day off cause I had to move, uh, cause I felt terrible for asking my dad for the day off. And I did, I actually moved in the morning. I know I moved in the afternoon, but in the morning they wanted to see me in the city. I had, at this point I lived outside of Boston and the interview was in Boston. I had no idea how long it would take me. I thought it would take me hours to get into town. So I drove like two, two hours before this, before my interview, I sat outside for 45 minutes no idea what to wear. I've never been in a job interview. And uh, I go upstairs, I, I shake his hand and he looks me dead in the eye and he goes, your hands are filthy. <laughs> and I had like scrubbed my hands. I had, like, you know, thinking I have to like present myself and he, he laughed. He goes, no, no, no. I appreciate that. Like it shows that you're a hard worker. And I'm like, Oh, all right. And long story short, he ended up offering me the job on the spot. And he called me later and then offered me the job and then gave me the financial side of it, how much money I could make, blah, blah, blah. And it was, you know, two, three X what I was making with my dad. So it was huge. So I end up, uh, you know, giving my dad a month notice and just was like, I want to help. I don't want to leave you high and dry, H happy to help train. And I went and worked for this company for four years. Um, and it started as they called, they called it a temporary position of an assistant superintendent. And I basically literally babysat con contractors uh, doing a, a renovation in an occupied high rise. So I would have, I'd be in charge of making sure that the work got done, that the people that live there were safe and all of that. Uh, and that eventually turned into me becoming an assistant super, uh, I'm sorry, an assistant project manager on a new high rise that we were building next door. Um, and I worked on that project from what we call the enabling phase, where we basically moved utilities underground, cut off a portion of an existing building so we could drop this 10,000 square foot plate into the ground and built this 32 story high rise. And I brought that to about 80% complete. Um, and I say 80% because for the last, the year, the last year leading up to my, um, me leaving, I had really started doing more side work on the side and I, I was doing more and more carpentry. I was renovating at night. I was working on the weekends. There was times I, I, I remember I was remodeling a kitchen and they didn't live there. So I would work 6, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. on my day job and I would drive there. I'd get dinner on the way and I would work till one in the morning on the kitchen. And I was dating my girlfriend, now wife, um, at the time. And, and it was, it was brutal. Like we would ha literally hang out by sleeping next to each other from three in the morning till five in the morning. And it just got to a point where, you know, I, I always blame her. And every time I tell the story in front of her, she says, I never said that. Um, but I, I, I always, I, I, I guess if she didn't say it, then I probably felt that the relationship wouldn't sustain if I worked like this. And ultimately, I gave my notice and I was super nervous to do it because, you know, like I said, I hadn't had many other jobs. The only time I gave someone my notice was my father, which was terrible. Um, and when they found out what I was doing, they basically said, listen, if it doesn't work out in a month, a year, a couple of years, just call us your jobs here. And that was huge. I was, I was like, so I literally have nothing to lose at this point. Uh, and that's when I started NS Builders. That's amazing. I, I'm, I'm actually like, there's a part there where you were talking about you describing like the story of like how this person reached out to you and the whole time thinking like, well, how do you find you? Like, <laughs> I guess my college, um, it's funny. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain my college like sent out, like sent out recently graduated mm. construction management degrees and resumes. I'm assuming. Cause I, 
I guess I, I like vaguely remember building a resume in school. Mm. So I, I, yeah, I, if I were to guess, that's probably a pretty good guess. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it seems like the persistence of someone to like go after some, you know, to like go after someone for a job, right. For, for an interview, it just seems like they had to have some sort of information to know that, right? It could have been like, in, I'm right. just speculating here, your resume might have carried some of that previous work history that you had right. in, with your family. And I'm sure that could have stood out. Because Yeah, and that, that definitely played a role. And he, he always told me, he was like, it was literally you showed up in what you thought was you know, appropriate attire, which was khakis and a polo, which, he, which frankly was there was another kid that they interviewed that showed up in a suit and they made fun of him for the entire time he worked there for showing up in a suit. But he, um, he did, he attributed it to me. Um, by the way, I'm not knocking suits. I love a good suit. Um, yeah. but he attributed it to me like having, you know, dirty hands and, and being part of my father's business and being loyal and being like a hard, like just a hard worker. Um, and I later found out, which was a stupid move on my part. Like I had talked about how much money I was making compared to where, 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 what I was making at my dad's and one of the other kids that they had hired made like significantly less. And like, we got hired for the same role and it was like this ordeal. And I got, I got, I got sent to the boss's office and he, he like yelled at me, but then retracted saying, I'm just, I'm just messing with you. But yeah, like we, we valued you a little bit higher. So just, just shut up about it. And I was like, all right. Fair enough. Nick, um, you mentioned you were a skater. Did you did you end up making any ramps? Oh, yeah. Did? I started a company called Incline Ramps. Um, I had What'd you build? I, I, I built, uh, what is it called? A fun box, some quarter pipes. Yeah. Um, I didn't build, a, I built, I, they were all for me. They were all in my yard. And I, I built a whole website on GeoCities. And, you know, it was like, I remember creating, I remember what the logo looks like and everything. And it, um, it just it never went anywhere. No one wanted to spend the money. I swear that that's how I really got into architecture. Really? Is when I was a skater. Yeah. I, I, you know, I wanted, wanted to design skate parks. I would like put together little ramps, probably the biggest construction project I ever saw happen. I didn't exactly do it, but like my, uh, my godfather made a, uh, a quarter pipe for me. And yeah. then this other, uh, like just this box that actually designed to be sort of weird and it wasn't actually very good to skate on, but, um, that's really cool that, that you were actually building this stuff. I do want to, I do want to address one. I, I never really was a skater. I thought I was, uh -huh. it. I was terrible. I ended up being much better at riding a bike, but even that it was just, I would find the biggest jump I could to see how high I could go. But yeah, I mean, ram ramps are always so cool and just like, thinking about curving the skate light or masonite whatever you wanted to use at the time it was just an interest it was always interesting to me on how they were built fast forwarding to like a little bit on like when you you decide to you know start on your own what what kind of products were you getting on early on um did, so, did you make the move pretty confident about like what you needed to like your pipeline of projects were in place already or yeah how was that like yeah. I mean, I, so for years, I mean, I, I sold my first job when I was, so I started working for my dad at 11. I sold my first job when I was 15 and it was a shed for Mrs. Smith, uh, who is my art teacher. And it was because people, and I realized that people would come into my dad's shop because it was a fence company and they'd ask if he sold sheds and he said, no. And I was like, all right, well, here's a hole and you know, here's an opportunity. I can sell sheds and build them on the weekend. So I, that's really where it started. It wasn't NS Builders at the time, but sheds were, you know, they were mini houses to me. Like I, I put, you know, I'd spend two weeks building in a shed by myself, literally a jigsaw and everything else was, you know, hand tools. And um, but fast forward to when I started my own business and I was leaving my, my uh, high rise uh, job when I had announced that I was leaving the architect on that high rise had just bought a house and he said, and we developed a great relationship. So I make friends with all the architects. I'm, I'm great with architects, but we, you know, we developed a really good relationship in, in a working relationship in the sense that it, when, when there was things that needed to get done, he knew he could rely on me. 
So when I told him I was leaving, he was upset, but he told me, he's like, listen, I just bought this house. I want to do a full remodel on the entire home. I'd love to, you know, I'd love for you to take a look at it if you're interested. And at that point I had probably two other small, like a kitchen remodel and maybe a bathroom remodel lined up. So I had, um, I had said, absolutely. And it, it worked out timing wise. I went and looked at it and I mean, to think back, I mean, I remember, I remember what the contract was and it's like, I don't even know how I made any money, but it was because it was just me, you know, it's like Mm. at the end of the day, maybe I was making $7 an hour, but that the check was still the same amount. I wasn't looking at it as an hourly rate at the time. I, you know, I had no business running a business at that time. It was just, you know, I'm just going to go out and just charge what I think I should charge and, and do what I love to do. And I'll figure out the business later. And I had renovated that. I started taking on other um, carpentry projects. Um, you know, another builder started subbing me out for carpentry. Uh, so did some subcontracting and that was equal parts of when I started to get into social media and mm. start sharing. And that's where, you know, I started getting a lot of work through that is just, you know, fast forward, but like, that's where, that's where I started getting some of my leads through that because I was sharing so much about what I was working on, on these projects. I'm wondering, I don't remember what my second big job was. Probably. I I probably could think about it, but Nick, what was it like? I'm thinking about how you were basically a professional by the time you were 18 or even earlier, but then, and you, you know, well could have just continued practicing but you chose to go to college for this thing you're already basically a professional at, right? Like, can you talk about what that was like and what, what changed during the period of time that you were I don't sort of was, relearning I don't really, it? I don't really think I was a professional, to be, to be honest. Um, and I guess it depends on the definition, but I, at the time, no, I think I was, I was a carpenter and I could just be a carpenter and, you know, and that was, you know, there was no real, you know, thought about like, what does that mean? Like, yeah. Oh, I want to build homes, but there was no real, like, all right, here's how I execute on that. So going to college, um, was probably pushed upon primarily pushed upon me, um, from my mother. My dad was like, Nope, just come work for me. You know, you don't have to go to college. It's a waste of money. Uh, my mom definitely wanted me to go. She wanted me to do something other than work for my dad. Um, and go off and chase my dreams and thought that college was the answer to that. And, you know, I I certainly don't regret going to college. Um, Do I think it put me in the position it did uh, I have today? Not professionally speaking. Um, Well, 50-50. In the sense, yes, because if I didn't go to college, I wouldn't have gotten that job. And if I didn't get that job, I wouldn't have learned everything I, I learned about commercial construction, contracting, chain, like the, you know, how to build a high rise. Like I would have never had that opportunity, which that was, that is what lent me the ability to start my own business is when I started really understanding the, the nuts and bolts of running a, a multi-billion dollar development company, not running it, but being part of it. And those are the things that I attribute to me being in a, a more professional environment where I could feel as though I, I was successful at it. So, uh, you know, and, and ultimately I wouldn't have met my wife who I met because of the job I got. So, you know, no, I don't regret going, but I don't think it, I, I don't think it really lent me the education that I had hoped it would. Yeah. Uh, Nick, the, this idea of, you know, learning from a, you know, multi-billion dollar developer, like a, like a really successful developer. And then going back to small, I think there's something interesting, but this difference between like a small company that goes from zero to like hundred, hundred K versus mm-hmm. going from like a large company, but currently small. And yeah. I, I feel like as, as I listen to the conversations that you're having, as you work through, like how to build NS builders to be bigger, to be more ambitious you can really hear how you're trying to kind of catch, not, not catch up, but you're, you know that there's this vision of um, running a bigger operation uh, that always seems like you're kind of always on that track. 
What, yeah. what were some of the things that you saw at that larger scale builder that you thought like, I, I would definitely continue this um, at, you know, 10 people, 15, 20, just kind of like waiting to uh, set that up because you know, you've seen it work. To be honest, it really comes back to um, planning and design. And that's what I realized that the residential market lacks so much of. Um, and also, we can talk about the finance, financial side of that, what, requ- what, what it requires financially. But, you know, to be on, you know, it's a, it was a hundred something million dollar project. But, you know, so, but there's engineers for everything. Mechanical engineer, structural engineer, you know, uh, precast engineer. There's, um, you know, a, a, an engineer for the envelope design. There's like everything had an engineer. And then you had, you know, this team that would, co- would coordinate it. And I remember this kid, Blake, he, he sat in this room by himself, blaring techno, drinking Red Bull all day. He was like a maniac, but I loved, he, I loved him because he would sit there and he'd have four monitors going with the plumbing on one, HVAC, electrical. And then, he'd on, and then on his screen, he'd have the model for the steel that they designed. And then he'd import the, the, the precast and then he'd import the HVAC, the plumbing, the, at every, like, there was so much thought and coordination that went into this. Yes. Did the torch come out on the job site? A hundred percent. Something got missed, but they were thinking so far in advance and, and working through the details. So yeah, that high rise got stood up and, and people were moving in, in two years where it's like, you look at some of these houses and they can't get built that fast. Now they're wildly different, right? You know, there, there's the level of execution and, and craftsmanship and detail are wildly different as well. But it was interesting to me, and you know, the lack of um, craft beyond the the uh, the engineered side of it, like the interiors and the finishes, that's really where I lost my love for it. You know, seeing seeing the the 150 foot deep caissons go in the ground and the steel go up and the precast get installed. Like all of that was really exciting to see all go together, the mechanicals, the mechanical rooms. And then once you got the drywall and, and vinyl baseboard and vinyl floors and cabinetry that cost $1,100 for the whole unit, I just started losing the love for it. But what I, what I really aim to take away from that and, and implement into what is now NS Builders is the processes in planning and pre-construction, which is I'm, I'm, I'm laughing on the inside because we have so much room to grow from a planning standpoint as a company, but also a lot of the processes in which, you know, subcontractors are paid, you know, that you're tracking their documentation to make sure that they, are, they can legally be paid, that, you know, how are you tracking RFIs and submittals? How are you making sure that your communication is thorough enough that the team knows that they're on the same page? And it's, you know, taking what I learned or what I saw in commercial and implementing that into the residential market really made a lot of sense to me. And beyond that, getting to a point in the residential market to find jobs that would financially support that model, meaning... I can have a full-time superintendent on a project that might cost a little over a hundred grand to the company for a year, but Hey, that, I mean, that makes sense to have him because you're asking for a really high level of execution. And the only way we can do that is with thorough supervision and someone that knows what they're looking at and, and can oversee a team of people to do it. So that's been really the focus of, all right, if I'm going to grow a company that, that is designed this way, then I need to make sure I, I'm I'm selling projects that can financially support it. Hmm. Does for, is is the high bar of quality for you? Is that determined personally? Like, is it something that just comes out of you? Like, you want you f- like it's. I'm, I'm assuming there's some pride, the sense of pride, and like just delivering really, really high quality. Does that drive where you wanted to play? Like, the kind of products you wanted to bring on, or was it? Because it seems like even making that decision, that strategic decision of hiring someone uh, full time for that role, it's like it's part of the business model. Yeah. But that business model kind of has to start with a vision somewhere as to like where, where do you want to operate? Is it? I'm, I'm curious, like for you, if it was like something you were pulled into, like you just started to get this kind of like type of work, and so you started to reorient yourself to that, or was it 
were you intentional about it from the beginning of saying like NS Builders is going to be this type of firm relative to all other con- all other builders? Yeah, I think in, in in some ways it was intentional in the beginning, but it certainly wasn't at the level it is today. And I I I say it all the time is that when I was a carpenter, I was a decent carpenter. I'm not, you know, there, I have carpenters that I work with now that are far better at carpentry than I am. And, but, you know, it was, you know, largely due to the fact that I was also trying to build a business. So when it got to a point where I should redo something, I didn't have the ability to, because I needed to be onto the next thing. and I need to build a business and it would have been far less expensive for me to redo it then than it is now where you know, it's easy for me to say, let's redo this because I'm not physically doing it. I get to go back to my office and focus on selling the next job or communicating with the client. And maybe my guy's a little mad at me, but, and, and, and it costs me money. It, like that guy doesn't not get paid. You know, the guys get paid twice because, and, and, you know, because the, the question about, you know, where did the quality side come from? it was always of the mindset, but it has evolved really rapidly and largely due to social media Mm. because I'm immersed in inspiration Mm. about what I want to do. You know, I I'm constantly scanning over architectural documents, architectural homes. Like I can, I'm, you know, if anyone has a show that, they binge on Netflix that can replace all the grand designs shows that I've ever watched. Like let sign me up it, because it's, I just, I'm, I'm amazed by it. And I really absorb the details when they talk about what, you know, what they did and why they did it. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm enamored by Austra- like w- Australian contemporary architecture. It's by far like, you know, it That's has good. put me in a position where I I've considered moving that. Just yeah. so I can work on it, you know. Do, do you watch the local project on YouTube? Yes, yeah. it's the. I, I will. I will tell you this. It is the so only good. thing that I get notified on that no matter what I'm doing, I stop mm. and I'm like, I, I got eight minutes. I'm watching this video. Everyone, leave me alone. And I have used them as inspiration for some of our content. But, uh, unbelievable, like unbelievable stuff. But for me, it's, I, you know, and I did, and I'm not afraid to ask either where it's, you know, I talk to different architects and, and, and dig into the, like, why does that look so good? It's like, well, we really thought this through and, you know, this, this shadow gap, it it really shouldn't be a quarter inch. It really should be five sixteenths or three eighths because the level of discrepancy is hit. And I'm like, okay, that's noted. Like never doing a quarter inch shadow gap again, or, you know, and I, and I, and I absorb these things and I start realizing that, I'm basically banking this, this approach to how I do everything where on a job site, I'll be walking around and, and like dissimilar materials has been this like thing for me recently, where if they're dissimilar, don't touch them, like completely c- mm. celebrate the fact that they're a totally different material. And I think of McKim down in Australia, who does a fantastic job at that, where a vanity might be close to the wall, but he's not scribing the stone to the wall it's left off and it's intentional and it looks intentional and it, it doesn't look like it was cut wrong. It was intentionally done. And, you know, I start grabbing those things and realizing that there's a better way to do, do these things. And we need to be more intentional with the way we approach everything. And, you know, from the quality standpoint, it, it comes down to, Hey, after it's installed and my guy, I want everyone to be able to stand back and look at it and be like, that's the best that like, this is my best. Like I gave my best at this and, and, and we're not perfect, but if you're, if you're always feeling as though you're putting out your best, then you're doing something great where there's been lots of times where we know we haven't put out our best and it's, and it's no matter, like I've ripped out a whole kitchen because we stepped back and said that we missed the bar on this and we missed the bar big time and it costs a ton of money, but we, and, we sat in that room and Ken who runs my shop and I were standing there and him and I spent the whole day trying to fix some of the issues. And if you want to read that story, I posted a blog about it. Um, But we, I looked at him and I said, is there anything we can do in this space to get this to a point where you, that you go home and feel like 
that like you would be proud of this. And he said, no. And I said, okay, I picked up my phone. I called the client. I said, we're ripping your kitchen out. Let us know when you're, you can go away on vacation and we'll do it around that week. And it's just, it's enormous. Like, I mean, it's, you know, from a financial standpoint, it's, it's brutal. You know, like last year, we did a rough calculation of $150,000, $160,000 of work that we ripped out because we weren't happy with it. Not because a client wasn't happy with it, because we weren't happy with it. Mm. And- with, those, with those projects, I- I'm curious if like you also see it somewhat as an investment though, right? Because you're 100%. so ingrained in, in social media. Because mm-hmm. it reminds me a lot too of your conversation with Studio McGee. We, I, I'm very much obsessed with Studio McGee from a business model perspective. I think Super they, smart. they've cracked the code. Uh, yes. on how to turn design into profitable business uh, through flywheel effects and stuff like that. And it, like, and, and this is something that I, that, that I think we, everyone that's in the kind of the process of making physical things is also a content creator. And it seems like in, in your world, you really took that on, you absorbed it to the point where, you know, and maybe people listening might find this very strange, but the fact that we're talking about and it's such a big expense as marketing, it's it all comes down to like, you know, you're going to take pictures of this. You know, you're going to bring a photographer in yes. or, you, or yourself. It's going to be part of a story that you're going to tell, which is going to draw more people into you. I mean, even the fact that you would do that, I'm sure it's, for the architects here, it's kind of like perking them up because it's there's an authenticity to what you're talking about, which I think is 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 really amazing. But more to the point, it's like you are you have skin in the game. You're also saying that like, I care so deeply about design and execution. I'm willing to go this far. Right. And here's the receipts. Like here's the before and after picture of it. Here's everything. But it's like, you know, other people might just sort of keep that. If they did that, they might just keep it to themselves, but it's strategically part of your business. Yeah. And we've, and we've like flat out decided to promote it. And, you know, and trust me, I get a ton of pushback. Like, dude, you, you're really walking the fine line. Like you, people are hiring you as a professional. And if they keep seeing that you're making mistakes, you know, they're not going to want to hire you. And I'm like, I, I guess, but that maybe that's just not who I want to work with. You know, I want people to appreciate what we do. And, you know, it, I think the hardest part it's the hardest on my team because when they work so hard to get something done and maybe, it, maybe it's fine, but I look at it and I'm like, we could have done that better or we could have laid this out better or the detail could have ended up better. Let's redo it. And they're like, dude, you know, I've just spent all week building this and it's tough. But, you know, I had this conversation with one of my guys last week where I said, you know, hey, I know, I know that was, I know that kind of sucked because you were so far along, but I just want to give you a heads up that we were in the running to build this house and they were going to interview three builders. And she flat out said, I've been watching your social media. I love your approach to how you are so committed to doing the best job every single time that I'm just going to hire you instead. I don't even want to talk to anyone else. And I was like, there, there's my ROI. And they're like, I want you to believe that what we're doing here, you know, yeah, we can hide it behind the curtain, but at that point, now it's just an expense on the, on the, the balance sheet, right? It's just an expense where the other option is let's, let's take it as an expense and then use it as promotional material. Cause every, er, er, every single thing that we do should be promotional in some sense. Mm. And, you know, and the, the other portion of that is, you know, let's talk about all the good stuff too, right? It's, I want, you know, I want to put out the very best and I don't want to have to look at my photos and be like, Hey, maybe I shouldn't post that because someone's going to see the miter that's cracked. You know, I, you know, that's a real thing. Everyone filters everything that they put. I don't care who you are, including myself. We all filter what we post because we want, we don't want, we don't want to get, Hey, I got a guy standing on the top rung in the ladder. You think I'm going to post that? Probably not because what they're going to tag OSHA and and then I'm going to get a fine in the mail or something. But we, we all filter what we, what we share with the world. And I try, and I genuinely try to be more transparent and be more honest with it with, but walk that fine line of, I still need to attract the right clientele and I can't just be like, I'm this guy that screws everything up and I'm going to take a ton, ton of time and you're going to pay what you pay. But it, dry, it, it pushes me and my team to do our best too, where it's like, you know, I'm walking around with a camera. You know, there's a video, there's, 
there's a video camera with on site at least once a week. And it's like you, you, it puts this, it puts pressure on everyone to make sure that they're performing at their best, mm. and I, which I love, but it, ulti- it ultimately it comes down to me as a business owner is that it puts pressure on me to make sure that I'm supporting my team of doing the best yeah, and giving uh, them the opportunity to. How, how let's, let's dive into that a little bit. So you are definitely immersed also, like you were mentioning before Netflix and like consuming all this kind of like helps to provide that inspiration for you as to like where to go the North, you know, in terms of quality, um, the local project videos and whatnot. How, how does that for you come back down to tr- help, help train your team? Right. I mean, so there's like the expectation, like the, the expectation setting for them and the training for them to let them know like, Hey, this is the level of quality that we expect Here's what, here's, you know, I'm very curious to, if you can unpack that a little bit more of like, how does what you're looking at, what you're thinking about that level of quality come back down to the people that are actually doing it? And what's that look like? From It's uh, not, it's not as structured as I think a lot of people think it's really, it's really casual in, in conversation in the sense that, you know, as we approach different, difficult issues, as we run into problems, or as we approach things, it's, you know, we're, we're just having a conversation and, you know, and yes, there, there's this fine line of pushing people, driving people to get stuff done, but, you know, but also saying, listen, I'm not trying to rush you. We need to be efficient with our time, but you have to understand like the end goal is, you know, excellent. Like I, I, I do a really, I do, I, I spend a lot of time trying to avoid using the word perfect because we, we can't achieve that. But using the word excellent, like I want this to be an excellent product. And if, you know, excellent means you've put out your very best. If that means you got to frame that wall with engineered stud, because I want that wall a 30 second flat across the whole surface, then buy engineered stud. You know, we didn't account that for, for that in the budget. Okay. Well, did we account for the plaster to build the wall out three quarters of an inch with plaster when the studs move? It's, you know, it's, I get it. Like there's going to be, there's going to be a constant pushback. There's going to be someone with their hands on your chest, trying to push you backwards the whole time. But what you need to do is you need to dig your feet in and power through that and figure out the solution. How do you get through this? How do you get to the end result? Because that no matter what, we're, you're always going to have adversity. You're always going to have someone, something working against you, but we need to do everything in our mind and and everything in our power to work through that and, and to achieve the result that we're looking for. And oftentimes, especially when, you know, we're driving towards being more creative and being more intentional is that it's not that first solution. It's not, how do I get through this? All right, I'll do this. It's not at that point, you almost have to stop and say, all right, that is, I can achieve it this way, but is there another option? And what is that other option? And, you know, do they net a different result and which one is better? And it's draining. Like it, it is, it's very draining and it's, you know, and I think about it, I, I, I'd be lying if I said that I, I'm on this high cloud every day because none of us are. And there's times where it's like, man, I just should be mediocre. Like it, it's, it's so much, it would be so much easier. I'm watching guys, you know, around me, my peers of mine, like other people in this industry that are local that they're, they're, they're mediocre. Like they're just kind of doing what they do and they're making a ton of money. And they're su- they're successful, and you know it's not about the money, but it's like, but sometimes it's you know it it, it hits the brain in a certain way where it's like you know what screw it, I'll just I'll, I'll slip down a, a notch and just kind of do basic stuff. But at, at the core of who I am and who I want this what what I want this business to be, it's just not there. Right. And furthermore, you know, just last week, I you know, twenty twenty, I don't have to dig into it. It was a tough year for many reasons. And it was one of our worst years, even though we were busy, it was one of our worst years for, for a number of reasons. And I felt as though we started drifting off of the, the, our, the path of what our goal was. And I really, and I said, everyone in the office tomorrow, you know, we, we need to realign each other. And I just want to be clear of what my expectations are of you guys and be clear of where I want this company to head. Because where I want this company to head is very different than what this company was when a lot of you guys were hired. And frankly, 
that, that this isn't going to change. And I want you, everyone in this room, I want to be part of it. But if, if you guys don't want to be part of it, I want to be an advocate for helping you find another opportunity, you know? And, but that, that constant realignment is important. And I'm talking about it right now, re- like knowing that I need to be better at that and really having this like big picture off of my board, like this is where we're, we're going after and this is what our focus is and this is what the company looks like and this is how we get there. And, mm. but it is, it, it really comes down to these casual conversations of, you know, ev- every moment, every job walking through, taking a look, like me putting eyes on things and just kind of getting someone else's feedback as to how did we get there? Do you think we could have done that differently? Would it, w- would we have be- net a better result? but giving the opportunity to the team to, to achieve that too. Do you end up pushing back? Are you the hands on the chests of the architects in some ways? Or just like, or do you end up pushing back on the architects too from that iterative process that you're describing or that kind of like, um, um, yeah, it's like basically like from the quality perspective, are you providing that feedback or are you so far down? The, like where, where does that hand off? Yeah. Happen? I mean, I'm usually, I'm definitely in that initial meeting. I definitely ask like, Hey, listen, I'm super opinionated, but I, but I promise you that I I'm, I'm, I have our, the, the project's best interest in mind. And, you know, and I, I, I ask, you know, and like, make sure. And, you know, even in oftentimes it's really live. We'll be on a job site meeting in progress. And we just had a project where, you know, I, they had done the design and I was like, you know what? I'm going to have it rendered. So I paid to have it rendered because I love seeing what our goal is sharing it with the team. Like, look at what this is going to look like. Cause then everyone gets in the mindset of like, all right, now I understand what we're going after. And after I rendered it, I realized that there was these HVAC vents on this wall that was otherwise really blank. And it was the first thing that you saw when you walked in. And I was like, and I'm sitting there and I usually do this thing where I'm like, and I look around, everyone's like, all right, he, he's got something. And I'm like, can I just propose something? May, it may, you can tell me no. And the architect's like, go ahead. And I'm like, what if we get rid of those HVAC vents and we throw them up into a reveal be, below the steel truss so it comes up and over this plastered return? You'd never see it. It would supply the air appropriately, but you, we don't have the vents on the wall. Nice. And it turned into, it, yeah, it, it is nice, but it turns into this like overly complex detail that like we spend weeks thinking about and detailing. And, but at the end of the day, it's, this is why, like, this is what we're hired for is to be creative. So from the architect standpoint, I genuinely believe that I'm going to generalize you guys, that you guys design with a, with, with, with a certain um, level of detail, understanding that a lot of things that you want to be built can't be built or you'll get pushed back on. So you'll bring it to a certain threshold and stop where it's like, I really wanted that cantilever to be like 17 feet, but he's probably going to push me back. And so we'll just kick it down to four. And you know, where I I'm of the mindset, I'm like, no, draw that 17 foot cantilever, you know, on a 10 foot wide house. Cause I want to figure out how to do that. And, and, and I do think that, you know, architects and designers in, in general, they're they're refrained from from designing to their fullest potential because of the limit that a builder may have or the 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 capacity a builder wants to put into the the thought of that project Mm -hmm. most guys i mean right rightfully so most guys just want to perform they want to actually give me a set of drawings i'll build whatever you design and they'll go for it where i'm taking it i want to challenge everything Hmm. And over, you know, and overthink because it's fun for me. It's it's fun for me to take a drawing and sketch through details. And you know, we took we we had a draw that we were supposed to be building last year, end up not going through with COVID, but it was a very basic design. And I called the architect and I'm like, hey, you know, are you taking this any further? Like wall section details, anything? He's like, No, probably not. I'm like, can I do exterior insulation on this house? I'm like, I'd love to get it down to a net zero you know, a, a, a higher performance. He's like, I can't draw that. And I'm like, can I? And he's like, yeah, no problem. And I took that and I redrew the whole house, just like on, on paper, up my, my board, figured out the whole thing. And, and then we were, we were golden. And, but that's fun for me. It's like to take something where it's, it was almost reverse where it's like the, the architect couldn't do it. 
So I was like, I, I know I can work through these details and we can end up with a better house and a healthier house. I think this is a good time to start talking about, um, cause I think we're, we're hinting at this idea of the unique skills that you've brought in house at NS builders. So the most visible, obvious difference between you and most other builders is that you brought in a whole, what appears to be a whole creative agency inside of your firm. Um, and it's, it's been a huge success. Mm -hmm. Um, what I, I have a sense that another in-house skill set that you have is this mill workshop that's unique to you being a contractor. Like not every contractor has an in-house mill workshop. Right. Um, are those the two, like, are there other like disciplines that are usually disconnected from the contractor, either they're a sub or they're just completely absent, like a creative production house? Uh, you mean comparing to what is considered normal? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the, I think the mill workshop is definitely one. I mean, there's definitely, there's definitely builders that have their own cabinet mill and mill workshop and it's, it tends to be in the, the higher end market um, because they want to control things and they want the ability to, um, you know, have that in house for, for control or for quality control. And really it came down to us for like the creativity side where it's, you know, there's a lot that we can be really creative with in the mill workshop that doesn't necessarily attribute just to cabinetry, but, you know, we need the shop to be able to perform some, some of these more intricate details. Yes, we could sub it out, but it, it's nice to have that in-house. It's, it's something I thoroughly enjoy. I love being able to hop out in the shop and go through details. And, and that's something, that's an area that we, we do get really creative with and really think through a lot of that stuff. Um, the creative production team is really just one person um, or, you know, and, and partially my, my role and, you know, that is something that I've, you know, I've, I've just, I've, I saw early success with it. And from a marketing standpoint, I just, i thoroughly believe in, you know, in the marketing initiative behind what we're doing. I think that being, taking a company from a one person carpentry company to now building multi-million dollar homes in the, in the, the stint of seven years with a relatively young team you know, we've been invited to the, the ta a table discussion with some pretty prominent builders that have been doing this for 20, 30, 40, 50 plus years. And it's been, be it's because of the, the awareness that we've created around ourselves. And, you know, it's funny, you read something off my website, we've become the most, one of the most renowned builders in Eastern Massachusetts, which, you know, I didn't write for the website, one of my creative guys did, uh, which I appreciate. And I, and I, looked that up and I'm like, I don't, I didn't know if I felt okay with it, but when I read the, like the, the real description of renowned, I'm like, all right, I mean, I can kind of see how that attributes to who we are. And it's because of the awareness that we built and, and people wanting to work with us. And, you know, it, you know, it doesn't mean that we've been around the longest or we do the best work but we've definitely created a name for ourselves, And, you know, and I, I truly believe that we are putting out really excellent work at the expense of whatever. And usually it's at the expense of the company because we, you know, if we're going to talk the talk, then we need to walk the walk. Nick, I think it's crazy that it does not appear as though the creative production is only coming from one person <laughs> and yet it was one higher. Right. And I'm trying to think about like, what are the other disciplines to unlock new levels of success for a company where you bring in a function that's not normal, right? It's not normal to put in creative production person. And the fact that it's only one hire is crazy. Well, so I, I think the reason why good. I, I was, I was going to bring this into uh, what about hiring an in-house architect or what about hiring an in-house engineer? Like, what, what do you see as next opportunities for bringing in additional disciplines? Considering you're, you, you know, on a job, you're realizing like, Hey, I'm going to take, I'm going to take some of this scope from the architect. Right. I, I do think that we're going to bring in uh, design in house um, to what extent I'm not sure yet. I think one of the first things we'll do is we'll have a drafter um, because from a shop drawing standpoint, we're subbing it out a lot and it's becoming uh, a pain point for us. 
the other side, you know, there's other portions of the mill workshop that we want to bring in house. Uh, but from the building aspect, I think having on site, I mean, uh, on staff architect slash design will be huge, especially as we grow into what the future company will be and what we really want to focus on. And one of the things we want to focus on is that Australian contemporary uh, inspired architecture here in Boston. And, you know, in how we achieve that will, there's, there's a couple of different ways that we think we'll go about that. But when we, when we start cruising down that path, it will be a matter of, all right, are we designing those in-house? Because frankly, I think I would love to, because I want to be part of that. And, and, a lot of the decisions that I make in the field could be discussed earlier on. And I'm doing that now. We're, we're doing that now because we've been able to really sell clients and architects on this, you know, more collaborative approach of working together through design. So oftentimes I'm bringing a project to an architect or an architect is mentioning a project or a client's mentioning that they're going to work. And I'm getting into the door. I'm like, bring me on board on retainer immediately. So when you start designing, we don't go down, you don't, you don't get a design that's worth $7 million when you want to spend three. And that's, you know, we're in a position right now where it's, they've designed the house to a point where it's an $8 million project and they want, and their budget was less than half that. And it's like, if we had been brought on early, earlier, we could have done some preliminary homework to make sure that we guided that design in the right direction. So that, yes, I think having that in-house would, you know, there's a potential that it would really help. The creative side, you know, it, it, Doug, Doug is, you know, basically capturing, producing, editing, and uploading the videos. You know, from the social media side, you know, he, he runs the YouTube as far as getting all the video out. You know, we're obviously part of the, I guess, the talent side of that. But everything else is, is you know, me posting. Um, we, but the, the content strategy is something that we have worked on for two plus years on and, and constantly refining, meaning I forget the number, but on one long format video, we can create 50 plus pieces of content out of that. And then that, and meaning that it might be 50 plus locations that that can be posted, a blog, photos, a quote, short clips, long clips, Facebook, YouTube, medium website, LinkedIn article, LinkedIn post. I mean, there's so much that can be utilized out of a single piece of content. And that's really where, you know, early on we were, we were doing so much work and capturing content and it was, it was like single use only. And it was such a waste. Yeah. I have a sense that there's this, I don't know, like there's a skill set that a contractor has general contractor to make a absolutely refined outcome out of total chaos. What, what appears to be total chaos in reality. Right. Right. Like the architect is working in one space. Uh, I I'm thinking about this perfect example. When I was working on a project, you know, I'd been drawing all these details about this project. I show up on site and all this stuff I never saw in the drawings was there. Like all the extra work the contractor put together, all the extra temporary material, mm -hmm. the, the trucks that come in. I just like, it, it was shocking to see like all the work I felt like the contractor did for me that I didn't know was even, you know, to make something reality. Right. And I feel like with, with how much complexity you, and it's not just one person building it, right? It's like coordinating all of that. I think that there's more respect uh, is deserved to the contractor discipline for its ability to um, orchestrate what appears to be chaos in, mm -hmm. into this refined uh, you know, outcome. But I, I'm thinking it, it reminds me when you know, we're talking about you know, one full-time hire, of course, like there's, there's the what's unique about this one person in your creative production uh, team of one. But a part of that, like the way that you like ran and, you know, took it to a level in reality that others uh, struggle to, I wonder about the other disciplines that you have yet to bring in house, you know, like, yeah. like the architect, uh, right. the way that when the contractor mentality that you have, like goes into starting to deploy design, 
you know, in, in this chaotic environment, but then somehow magically, I don't know how it happens, but even but you get, you end up with this totally refined outcome. Well, I think it, I mean, I think with that said, it, you know, it, it comes back to collaboration and, you know, it, because just the way you were describing it in my mind, you know, I'm, I'm, for whatever reason, I'm like attributing it to like a television show and music, right. Where the, you're in the architect's office, the music's mellow the whole time, you know, it's like, you know, pulls out the paper, draws the house, it's beautiful. And then all of a sudden you hand that roll of drawings over the builder and then heavy metal is playing for like six minutes <laughs> and they're flying, they're demoing and they're building and guys are swearing, coffee cups are getting thrown around. And then it goes back to mellow where the architect shows up and walks around the beautiful masterpiece he, 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 he drew. And, and, and to, to add some color to what you were just describing, where in my mind, it shouldn't be that. It should be, you know, a very steady, mellow music all the way throughout where the, the architect doesn't hand the drawings to the builder. The architect goes to the site and, and sits, the, the builder comes to the architect's office, sits down and combs through it. And then they walk to the job site together. And then they're working through the details and the architect is understanding that I never thought about the fact that you have to temporarily support that countertop until the epoxy cures. I'm going to make sure I think about that next time. And, you know, and it's way more collaborative and it's, you know, and I, there's, there's so many things that I think lead to the, the, the divide of builder architect. And one of them comes back to cost where, you know, every person that you know hires an architect they always ask what's this going to cost me to build hmm. and you know frankly that it's unfair for a, a client to ask that because you're not on that side of it you can take hey the last house that we did that one up there on the board uh yeah i remember that budget being two million dollars but do you know if that builder made money on that job do you know mm. if that was an, a success for that builder or like, yeah, maybe it costs a million because he felt so bad that he missed $400,000 of, of work and he just did it out of the kindness of his heart. And it's, you, you, there's this false sense of, of, of understanding of cost where if it was collaborative, you're like, Hey, all right, that, that house, I remember working on that with him. I'm going to give him a call, check in like, Hey, how, how'd this house go? Where I got another similar project, you know, that one costs $2 million to build. Is that, was that, and did, did that end up in a good position? Like, did you guys, did you, was that a success for you and get that feedback and then go back to the client and then say, Hey, listen, you know, here's a range of what that project costs. But at this point, what would be really, um, you know, what would be really beneficial to this conversation is bring, let's interview a couple builders. We're early in the design, but having a builder on board now, you know, even just as a retainer, just like, we just need some someone to be able to bounce constructability off of pricing off of sketch like availability of materials. Is it like can we even build what we're designing? And mm -hmm. having that person that is on the financial side, on the scheduling side, on the product procurement side, on your team, now it's this volleyball of information. The architect gets to to talk because you're because I'm retained, you know I'm retained on the project and ideally you know, that means we build the project, but if we don't, mm -hmm. Hey, that's okay. Like we've been compensated for our time. You paid me a retainer. That retainer said that we would be available for questions. We would put together preliminary estimates, preliminary schedules. We're, and we're billing against that retainer, but approaching it without that, you, the project always goes too far. And unless there's this, you know, n there's no worry in the world about what the project's going to cost. And they just want what they want. Yeah, there, those are there. There are jobs like that, but most most people have a budget, and mm -hmm. to to approach it in the sense of design it first and then find the cheapest guy is just wildly wrong in so many levels. This seems like such a. I mean, at this point, there's just been so much conversation over the years about like things like integrated product delivery. I mean, every, like everybody knows within the industry that this, that there is a challenge here about, you know, looking at the part of the project delivery model as it is um, 
and basically how you're describing it, right? Like people should be brought up. Everybody should be brought to the table at the very beginning. From your experiences, like, do you find it that once you work on that project with an architect, let's say it's an architect you're working with for the first time, what's the likelihood that they then use that approach again or try to pitch that approach again consecutively for new clients that they have in, in your region? My my finding is that it's difficult with the guys that have been in the industry for more than a handful of years. Um, the younger guys are definitely more, op- I, I say guys, the younger architects are more open to it. Um, you know, when I, when I pitch it to the, the older architects or the, the architects that have been doing this for a while, they all love it. They all think it's incredibly valuable, but it, it, it usually is this whole like shit sandwich, right? Mm. Where it's like, you know, that's not going to work. I love it. It's, you know, I think it's super smart. You know, I, I think it would bring a lot of value to the client, but you know what? Our clients aren't just, uh, just aren't going to go for it where it's like you, 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 everything says that we should try this together. You, you believe in it. it it's, it, it's, a, it could be a positive experience, but you're, you're refra- refraining from um, trying it because that's not what your client wants or that's mm-hmm. not how you've done it in the past. And, you know, once we go through it, you know, they're, they're, once we go through it one time, you, they're usually sold. Because, you know, ultimately it comes down to, you know, it's a benefit for you guys. And, you know, I I think about this, you know, one of, I I don't, I I try not to bid work uh, or get into a competitive bid process. Uh, Every once in a while I'll get a set of drawings where it's like, hey, they're considering three builders. They want a preliminary budget. Can you put something together? I look at it and, hey, is this worth me spending a week, a week of my time to be considered? And I look at who else is looking at it. It's like, all right, yeah, I kind of want to beat those guys. Let's let's see what we can do here. But I think about a project I, I bid four years ago, three years ago. And the drawings were perfect. I mean, everything was, was spec. Every, like, there was no questions on that drawing. Went through it. So for a builder, that's, that's pretty straightforward, Right. I just price exactly what you've drawn. I'm not making assumptions. I'm not making, I'm, I'm not carrying allowances. You got the towel bar holder that you want. Got it off. Yep. I got the price for that. Everything's spec. And I had price. Uh, I had, um, I was waiting on the drawing set and they had said, we want to start with demo. Can you start demo? And they talked to, they talked to three builders. They decided to go with me. I get in there. I'm demoing. I'm, I get the final drawing. So my guys are doing demo. I'm working on final pricing. He's like, he's like, listen, if demo goes well and the building likes you and everything goes well, like this is your job. And I submit my price and I get a, I get a call back. Like, dude, like, how is this a million dollars? I'm like, no problem. Like I'm happy to run through it and rerun through. And he's like, is there any way you can be under a million? I'm like, yeah, I mean, we can value engineer some of this stuff. Like you had some pretty crazy specifications in there. So let me relook at it. And we're like a hundred shy, right? So I look at it. I'm like, all right, yeah, we, we're, we're, what about 989? Like this, if we can be at 989, if you engineer, value engineer the, the handful of these things back down to X, Y, Z. Perfect. Thank you so much. Get back on site. Literally last day of demo, I get a call. Hey, um, I just need to let you know that you guys got to pack up your stuff. Uh, they decided to hire another builder. And I'm like, what do you mean they hired another builder? I mean, we used, this was our job. Like we're here. To, mind you, I did the demo for free. I forgot to mention that part. Oh, my so, God. or for no markup because I was like, Hey, this is a great oh, job. Yeah. All right. So let's fast forward two years. They call me and ask me if I can come and fix some stuff out of, pure curiosity i was like no problem i'll come check it out and i walked the job and i'm like all right cool and i asked i they end up it, it became really shady they wanted me to fix stuff and they were they were offering me the ability to take credit for stuff and i was like listen this just isn't for me like it's just i i was i was more trying to do you guys a favor but i just i can't be part of this i found out later on that 
the pricing was never presented to the client. And I, and I was curious as to why. And it was because the architect communicated a price to the client. And when I came back with my price, mm. it was so far off from what he had communicated that it would have been embarrassing to, to share. Did everyone just hear that? <laughs> so crazy. And to think. I'm probably common. The project, you know, the project ended up like again here's this like vision of the project's beautiful it ends up in magazines it ends up mm. all over the place no one will ever know that that project was successful or not successful except for the people that were involved and that's what's frustrating to me where it's like if we had worked together we could have made that job that job would have been a success mm. instead it wasn't a success but it on the outside it looks like this massive success to everyone because you get to promote this beautiful project. There's something about like a lack of focus on the client experience end to end, which I think is part of the problem in some way where, you know, organizations and firms are, can be so focused on like them eating, right. They got to eat. So they're mm -hmm. focused so much on like them covering their ass in some yeah. capacity that they lose sight ultimately to like what it's going to actually be the best outcome for the client. And it, it's, um, it's interesting. I mean, your story is crazy. And so someone commented that they're going to have nightmares about your story. Uh, I'm wondering if the architects in this chat, <laughs> that would be crazy. Uh, but but, I, later but I think, I think it's, I mean, I think that's a really uh, important story to tell ultimately, like, you know, most clients, if they've not done a project before of that magnitude, they have probably a primary concern, right? Cost is a huge concern for them. They don't really understand. You have to be educated the entire time. So really the job of everyone involved is like context setting, expectation setting, helping them to understand like, hey, this is actually the reality. Like you might have like this dream that you can afford this project. But, um, you know, as we'll get into maybe like, lumber right now is not doing so good and like steel is also pretty crazy and so you know all all of that has to happen at the very beginning and and i think the understanding that sort of needs to happen too is that ultimately like you know some of those problems are so upstream like maybe it's just the wrong client right like totally. wrong client. And, and improper due diligence yeah. understanding like what you know what's really driving the motivations for this client? You know, what's their, like, do, are they going to push back on every little thing that we're trying to do here? Right? And that, and, and to speak to that, you're, that is so, you know, undervalued in our decision-making, I think. And in that, in that particular story, I never got to meet the client, never got it to meet. I worked through a client rep. Um, I was never going to meet the client. And, you know, I fast forward that two years, I end up meeting the client and I could see that it was very number driven, which maybe I would have sniffed out and realized it wasn't the right client for me. But I do, I think as a whole, you know, and I'm wildly guilty of this is that I fall in love with projects. Forget the client. It's like, I got this project up on my board. It's, it would be huge for us. Huge. And I have an interview next week to, for, the, for this project, and it's a big project for us. And, but it's what we're, we've been striving to get to. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, fits the, it checks all the boxes. But I haven't met the client. And right now, I have been, it's been communicated to me that I have a disadvantage due to my price. And it's, you know, but it's also, it's early on. Like, we're, we're at schematic design. And if they're pricing schematic design with three people, well, schematic, I mean, my assumptions are that I'm going, you know, balls to the wall with everything, you know, like ultra flat, it's, it's a contemporary house. So I'm doing ultra flat, like 12 foot straight edges on the wall. It, like, is that what they want? Or are they looking for a regular, excuse me, trowel finish? You know, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, an HVAC system that is cost more than my house. Is that what they want? Because that's kind of what this house calls for. So it's, you know, it, it becomes this assumption game. So I'm, I'm going to be in a, 
a meeting with them and have to ex- walk them through, you know, the benefit of the way I price this project. And, but it's, you know, I, I, I think about that particular scenario where it's like, I need the architect to advocate, be an advocate for that, not against me saying that my pricing is out of whack. Cause it's like, it, it's, I don't know, like, what are we using to measure out of whack? Because right now the the drawings, I can say the drawings are out of whack mm-hmm. or the spec is out of whack. It's like, it's not out of whack. It's just early. And it's like, we need to work together on this to make this a success. And, but I have to like, I'm in love with that project where I need to go into that realizing that number one, do we have the bandwidth? Number two, does the client value what we value? Or, and, and if they don't, is it a price, is it price or schedule that they value? where we're probably not going to be the fastest and we're definitely not going to be the cheapest. So does that just knock them out of the, the running where it's, you know, oftentimes we, we ignore those red flags and say, yeah, but dude, the house, this would be an awesome cover uh, picture for our website. It's like, yeah, not at the expense of a million dollars. Yeah. But that's the same calculus that the, that the architecture firm is also doing, or maybe not. Doing, right? they're, they're not, they're not, they might, be looking at this as a trophy project, something that's going to like help them stand out. But at the end of the day, it's again, like if you, it's going to be so much worse for that firm and for their, everything right downstream employees, everybody else that's on that project, they're going to hate it. Right. And like all those have other secondary tertiary effects to the business ultimately. And it all comes from the very beginning of being able to decide like, is this the right client? Ultimate. Right. I mean, in, in this case, you know, the communi- we've been communicated what their budget was, which is 2.2 times where I like is it, 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 I'm 2.2 times what their budget is. And it's like, I'm not, you know, and, and none of us, the three people that looked at it were, were, were even close to their budget. So it's like, how do we get, how do we get here, guys? You guys design this house. You had like, even if you, what what multiplier were you using? Were you using a regular, let's call it 500 bucks a square foot, which is a pretty decent allowance to build a new house, but not at the caliber this one was designed. The house that, that, that is designed, that's a, a thousand plus dollars a square foot. And it's, you know, and to, to unfortunately, what usually happens in that scenario and conversation is, man, they're going to be, they're going to be pissed that, you know, that, that your price is so high. And it's like, why? <laughs> why me? Why, why not? Why is it me? Why is it I not you? Yeah, yeah. I'm, like, not, I'm not deciding what plywood costs right now. I'm, right. I'm literally counting how many pieces of plywood you put on the project. You know, this, is a, this also points to some other challenges that I think are kind of fascinating upstream of you, right, at, at the architect level. And you mentioned a little bit about going on retainer to a project as one potential solution. Is it possible that maybe what I'm, I'm not as familiar to, you know, how pervasive this might be already or not, but like, is it, how beneficial would it be for architects also just hire cost estimators? So like it, from, 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 from the experience that I have having uh, previously worked at WeWork where, you know, obviously you're producing a product over and over again in different markets, there's a whole team of cost estimators on staff to be able to do those projections and be able to try to get uh, on target, whether that was hit or not is questionable, but ultimately right. still like there was somebody there that was trying to solve that at scale. Right. Um, and I, and I just, there's something about this like need for this information to be more real time where like, obviously the magical solution would be somehow where, uh, you know, in the modeling tool itself, you get real time pricing, at least on material cost estimation. And then labor is another factor that could be, magically resolved by some solution right um i think that i think yeah i think i think there's a huge market for that and as i'm sitting here like i want to write this down and as a uh opportunity to resolve right yeah like this this could be our million dollar idea guys everyone that's everyone that's listening this you know you can buy into the the investment but no it's i think that there there is the ability to do that but the where you lose, like we've hired cost estimators that, that do takeoffs for us. 
and, you know, and they get the information extracted, which, I mean, you guys know some of the software that you guys use does that automatically where it's like, I, I remember I had an architect, we're doing her, building a, her house and she's like, Oh, do you want a lumber count? I can just click a button and it will spit me out a lumber count. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I want a lumber count. I'm like, if, if, if yeah. it's accurate, you know, but I, I do think that there can and should be um, some sort of uh, ability for, for, for cost estimation to be streamlined. Because at the end of the day, even when I'm on retainer, I don't really enjoy doing pricing. I don't really like, yeah, sure. The on-screen takeoff's fun. It looks like I'm coloring like a four-year-old <laughs> and I'm in drawing all over this drawing. And it, like I put my music in late at night and it's, it's fun. But beyond that, like entering all this information to a spreadsheet and here I am, like I'm talking about this and I still do it like entering line by line into a spreadsheet where I know that there's, I'm, I'm actively uh, exploring opportunities to streamline this, but there's still this like th this uh, uh, overwhelming amount of work, work, talking to trades. You know, I am very careful with that process where it's like, listen, I don't have this job. This is not my job. I, 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 there's no commitment from me. I need you to understand that, but I'm trying to get a gauge on where I think this pricing is going to fall. And I don't want to say I'm going to carry a hundred thousand dollars for your scope. If I don't have a clear understanding, if you think like, do you think a hundred thousand dollars could cover that? And I try to be really careful with that when I'm on retainer. Hey, listen, this is a more viable job for us. We're working within a target. We're pretty close. So I, I'm, I'm comfortable asking you to spend a little bit more time on it because inevitably we're going to build this job and I'm going to hire you to do it where, you know, to, I try to, I try to gauge that for my trade partners and subs and things like that. But I don't even remember where I was going with that, but I, I guess, you know, what it comes down to, Oh, the, the question about cost estimating. I, I think that there is this ability, especially with more streamlined construction in, you know, to really navigate that. And the more information that we input and we track and we're, we're, we're capturing um, in NS Builders, the more I look at ultimately the way for me to look at how to make NS Builders valuable is to standardize everything, create an mm -hmm. SOP where I could effectively walk away from the company and everything would run. And that's what, you know, that's, that's a goal with many businesses, like many, like anyone that wants to have their business live beyond their, their life. Right. And I look at pricing, for example, it's like, all right, let's build this out in a way that we can streamline this. We can look at things like, you know, is it by room? Can we look at each room and figure out how many square feet each room is, or can we quantify certain things, you know, rather than quantifying materials and quantifying each and every surface and, and things like that, you know, I do think that there's an opportunity for that to be connected back to the architect. And I think what I was getting at is that there, there still should be this level of builder involvement because there's, there's considerations of location where it is difficulties that they've run into beforehand where it's like, Hey, a steel beam for, you know, yeah, that's two guys for a day. And that steel beam is going to be $5,000. Let's carry 10 grand for that. Beam. It's like, hey, Right. But it's also in the back bay and you got to go through an alleyway. So I'm going to have to get a crane to pop, right. pop it over the right. building for $1,800. And, you know, there, there's this, um, you know, more wide, you know, widescreen vision of what's going on rather than the, the, the narrow focus of, all right, we got to get a piece of steel in this location. Um, Nick, you, you mentioned how you're hiring new management now. Um, so we've, we've touched on the idea of you hiring an architect. Uh, yeah. we've, we've talked about how you've made unusual hires and it has unlocked a whole new uh, opportunity for the company. But mm -hmm. right now your focus is on management. Can you talk about like what is going on in your current activities, what you're looking for? Because I think, I think I saw in a, in a question and answer that you did that you, you have actually hired a director of operations, but they're starting later in the summer. Yeah. Um, I would love him to start sooner. He just can't. Um, so we are, I, I alluded to the fact we started as a carpentry company. We've grown into a small remodeling company. 
larger remodeling company. And this year we're really focused on um, ground up new home, custom homes. And, you know, and w- individually we've done, individually we've done new construction as NS builders. We've only, we've done very little new construction, but it's always been the end goal of building really elaborate up ground up custom homes. So with that being said, it's been my focus for the last 12 months and really shifting our business into that market and getting a, a bigger, uh, casting a wider net to capture those type of projects. You know, even though if we looked at it from a, a profitability standpoint, it probably would make sense for us to just stick with the smaller renovations or remodels because they're more profitable and we can bang through them and we can be lean. And But it's just not what my goal is. It, my goal is to be, to build really architecturally distinct homes. So with that being said, you know, I kind of alluded to it earlier is that, you know, 2020 was a hard year for many reasons. And one of the reasons was, you know, I felt as though we were drifting off of alignment and that was because we were um, carpentry heavy and management light. So we were taking on projects to keep carpentry um, busy, not busy, but like working. So there would be projects that come across our, our, our plate where it's like not really what our goal is, but let's take it because it will keep people busy. And you get into this like whirlwind of just constantly taking on those jobs, never getting to the end goal. So this year we even just like even the last month or two, I think when we talked, I was in the heat of my thought process where I was like, I have a goal and I'm not achieving it. And if I'm going to achieve it, I need to make the decision to, to go after it and, and put blinders on for everything else and solely focus on the opportunity that lies ahead. And that's really what I've, that's really has, that has, and will continue to be my focus for NS builders is focusing on what our end goal is, what our, not our end goal is, what our goal is as a company for growth, the projects that we want, do they actually check the boxes or not and say, and be decisive? Yes, no, and move on and not, and not wrap ourselves up into these projects that don't fully fit. So from a structure standpoint, it is myself. Um, and right now I'm basically the support to my project managers. Um, we recently just lost one of our project managers. So we have one, we're interviewing for a second one right now. Um, but I, but there's, I'm a bottleneck for information oftentimes. So instead I've decided to hire a director of ops who will be between myself and the PMs. Um, and the director of ops will essentially oversee and support my project managers, make sure that they have what they need. And really be focused on pre-construction, you know, basically, um, let, let's say 50% of their time would be supporting the project managers, 25% or maybe even 30, 40% of their time would be focused on uh, pre-construction of new opportunities. And then 10, 20, 10 to 25% of their time would be business development and, you know, and hiring and things like that project managers would then oversee a team of superintendents and the project managers right now we're aiming to have two project managers with the the goal of eventually having three and each of those pms would oversee two jobs so that puts us in an area where we're doing four to six projects at a time not what we're doing now this is this is where we're what we're projecting and then from there so each project manager has two jobs and then each job has one super so going back to that management uh, style from commercial, that super has one job. They're going to that job every single day for 12 to 24 months. That is their baby. They're responsible for it. They're responsible for the, the success of it. The project manager supports that bo- those two, two supers and make sure that that project is a success, that the, the, the super is in charge of production. Project manager is in charge of schedule and, and uh, schedule and budget. And then the director of ops is ultimately, you know, overseeing all of that and making sure that everyone is on schedule and on budget. And from there, you know, that's that management side. We have, you know, we'll have our assistant uh, assistant project managers and or slash project directors um, and project coordinators. And then from there, rebuilding our carpentry team where I, I've always loved having carpenters on staff. We'll continue to have carpenters on staff now, just not as many as we had. And really, because we want to really structure the, 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 the management side of it to be successful with these larger projects, rather than focusing on where the carpenters are always going. Let's keep a core group of, of, of a couple of guys 
and they'll be able to support the, the carpentry needs across the projects that we have. And then eventually we can build out the carpentry side once we're kind of flowing with the projects that we're, 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 we're gravitating towards. That's awesome to hear you go into detail. Actually, a theme that's been showing up in some of our conversations with other architects is um, bringing on someone who is just has a business background, like not even industry um, experience. For example, a recent guest who's a monograph customer, Shane Balcom, he was a chief of staff at a tech company, right? Um, he was he ran sales teams. He comes to an architecture firm, and he starts applying these business, this business discipline that's like hard to intuit. Uh, and I'm wondering, like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of drawing a connection to what you can unlock from another discipline, like with what you saw with your creative production team. Like, I remember, I think I saw a video where you're like, you realize that the professional photography was like, yeah, so much better than <laughs> the right. photography you were doing. And it's kind of like, it's almost like this baseline of the industry, like bringing that, bringing one industry's baseline into your industry is always an opportunity right. because how, how, how many people are just looking at what their peer is doing to, um, to do what they should do. Right. No, I mean, so, I think, I, I think there's, it, as far as what we're going to unlock, I think in the next 12, 24 months, it will really be a, a well-structured management which will allow us to really focus on uh, approaching higher level jobs with a process, a very clear, distinct process on who does what, who's responsible for what, and having those to be having those me measurable. You know, a, a hiring a director of ops was really big for me. It was a big, a, a large responsibility because it was a, essentially taking something off my plate. But I needed to be able to do that in a manner that I could measure the success of it. So it took me a while to really think of how can we do this in a manner that I can measure his success. And with doing that, now I can trickle that down into measuring every position success and really unlock a well-orchestrated management side. The, I guess I was dancing around the architect side because the other portion of separate from what I just kind of chatted about is I would like to develop and I would like to build on spec quote, quote quote in quotes and i want it's i want to take a lot of risk surprise surprise i'm a risk taker but i want to take a risk in the sense i want to build a product that again the modern the australian contemporary architecture i don't it's not it's not here yet it's here sporadically but i don't see it being here as like this super well celebrated um uh, architectural movement but anytime that I've talked to someone that has built a modern house on spec, it sells with, in, a, in a week because the, there's no inventory for it. So a big part of me really wants to take a risk with it and say, I want to build super modern on spec and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build it, you know, I'm going to build it to the level that we build customs and we're going to sell it for a higher price point than the realtor tells me I can. So that, I mean, to anyone listening, that's like, all right, so this kid's going to fund this himself. Well, I, I can't, I don't have the, the means to do that. So I need someone that's crazy enough to jump in on this with me and believe, believe in it. And I, I have a handful of people that are open to it. Um, most of them are not, most of them are like, no, you're, you're fucking crazy. Like that's, you can't do it. Like the bank's not going to lend you the money. But if I can prove the model, I just need to prove it once. And if I don't and, I, and, it, and it flops and I take a loss on it, so be it. I still built it. I'll, I'll figure it out. Like I'm not, you know, I don't know why I'm so nonchalant about, you know, the, the, finan the potential financial loss. But I, I, I do remind myself that at the end of the day, it's, it's just money, you know, and I, I, I do not want to come off as as arrogant in that sense, like, cause you know, I'm certainly not what I would consider wealthy, well off or anything. And, and when I mean by just money is that if I lost my business and I, or I got sued and got put out of business or 
I, I lost my ass and I had to sell my house. At the end of the day, it's, I still have my family. You know, yeah, it's, that's a huge loss and it, will, it, 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 would, it could crush me. My employees could lose their job. They'll go find another job. I'll probably find another job. I mean, at the end of the day, it just, it's, not, it's not the end of the world, in my opinion, where it's, you know, I don't want to go my whole life wondering if I could have risked and made it where everyone usually tells you, well, worst case scenario, like what, what happens if it's, you know, you get sued or what happens if you lose a million dollars on, on that deal? And in my mind, it's like, you're talking, you're, everyone automatically goes to worst case scenario. Yeah. You know, everyone automatically says what happens if that, and no one ever says what happens if you sell it for a million dollars more than you thought. It's like, there's the, now we're talking best case scenario, but the, the, the reality is, is probably not going to happen. Probably not going to happen. It's going to end up somewhere right in the middle. Maybe I sell it and I make $1, right? And yeah. it's, you know, everyone has this mindset to automatically go to the negative And it's like, yeah, I guess that would suck. If I lost a ton of money and I had to sell my house and put my family out of a home, I mean, yes, the, the, that would suck. And if we had to restart, but what if I, what if that didn't happen? And what if, what if it was a massive success? And then all of a sudden my family, I could take my family on vacation for six months around the world. Like, I just, I just feel, I, in my opinion, I just feel like people and myself included, we don't, we don't take enough risks for the short time that we're here. And it's something that, you know, my wife and I have talked about a lot recently is like, you know, we're not getting younger. Like if, if we want to, if we want to try something new, we want to move in a different neighborhood. We want to go create, like, why not? Let's just do it. Let's figure it out. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. There's always, you know, in some sense there's always that reset button. But in some ways it's also what you're describing too, is a very, can be a calculated risk too. It's not like a full, you're not gambling, right? It's like, right. You, you have, you know, obviously you have the wherewithal to know what costs look like right now, right? So right. all that, all those elements are in your control and right. you have enough of a sense of being able to like, you know, figure out where the efficiency side, uh, side is on the fabrication side as well, right? Whether yeah. it's prefab, you bring, you figure out ways to reduce those costs. So, I mean, I, th- I mean, ultimately I'm not, I'm not privy to like what the market looks like, you know, in, in Massachusetts or in the Boston area or, or whatnot, but you know, those type of risks, I think, are super important. I think back to just even the Studio McGee um, interview your t- your, uh, in, on the Modern Craftsman podcast that you guys yeah. did. Um, just because, like, that was also a story of also taking a calculated risk in a sense, right? Both of them leaving uh, their jobs fully to, like, dive into this. Right. Um, but it was an iterative process of figuring it out. I mean, even in this, in, if, if you do this on, on spec project, there's other ways to look at the success of it. There's not just dependent upon how much you spend on it. But maybe you find out through it, like, wow, we were able to sell this through my audience. Right. That and, is an insight you can take for the next project. Right. And that's, and, and that's something that, you know, that's where my head's at with this is that, you know, I have, I've kind of tossed it around on Instagram on my stories and I've had people reach out where it's like, I've just tossed around the idea of like, Hey, I have this lot. It's in this location. We're thinking about an $8 million sell anyone interested. And, you know, and just kind of run tests. Like there's no risk with that. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, I've talked to a couple of people, like one of the guys that owns land, he's like, well, what's your approach with this? I'm like, honestly, I'm going to start, I'm going to toss a couple thousand bucks into a design and a rendering, a realistic rendering. And I'm going to market it and then see if anyone bites. And for whatever reason, I have huge confidence that if I market it without even like, without even going to market, just market it through my channel, someone's going to be like, I want that. And the other side of it, the other side of the measure that success is, all right, I build it, I make no money. And then someone says, hey, that house is beautiful. I just didn't like the location. Will you build me mine over here? And then it's like, there you go. I mean, I, I in uh, during my time at WeWork, one of the products I was working on was essentially pre-selling uh, uh, new markets. So, mm-hmm. 
WeWork is going to open up in Dusseldorf, figure out how to create like a location there. Um, and aside from that project was also like developing a tool to give like walkthroughs, like using Matterport scans and actual like 3D, right. um, more like 3D models that you can navigate through Yep. and put that in the hands of sales. And they were able to pre-sell spaces, millions in, in like what we call total contract value. Um, so like what you're describing, like I... I have a very strong intuition and experience. So like you can actually do a lot through that. I mean, right. Kickstarter, you know, you see this play out in different scales, Kickstarter projects, people buy into the vision of things, you know, as long as like the, the, you know, you just have to commit to the quality, the, the expectations you're setting with the rendering. A hundred percent. But that, that's the gap right there. I think people will will buy into those things if they build the, if you have the trust, which you certainly do have because you have a track record. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty, pretty cool bet to make. Yeah, and that's, you know, and everything, the biggest battle right now is just finding, getting the right team to be able to fund this where, you know, and I'm close with this one opportunity where I may have, you know, an opportunity to, pre-market it before acquisition where it's like, all right, here, here I am. I can almost do this at no risk with the exception of design. And if I pre-sell this thing, it's, you know, there's no risk. You know, the other, the other point to make for, for listeners here too, in gen in general is like, you're already seeing this also play out in the broader, like sense of other types of products that are existing out there, like ADUs, right. Which are blowing up, uh, in California, LA, yep. uh, on the West Coast, and some other markets, you're seeing the consumerization of spatial products, like these type of different design, right? The things that you can live in. Um, and more and more, what that is solving for is, again, going back to the very beginning, like, like really focusing on what the client expectations are and like the client experience, it's solving for that experience. It's trying to provide the same experience that people get when they're buying. I mean, look at a Tesla. You know, when people say like, oh, but I mean, but that's such an expensive decision to just buy a house a, a sight unseen or something. It's being done. Matterport's right. showing, showing that Redfin and Zillow are using these tools to pre-sell real estate in any right. market in, in, in the world. Um, and you're seeing it now with just like, you know, as we're talking about the consumeration stuff. So like, this is a huge area, an open opportunity for people to start to re recognize. And is that if you focus on the customer, the client experience or the customer experience and like really solve for that, make that, give them all the answers, give them that FAQ that lets them know what they get with it, all that other stuff that comes with it, really a package as a consumer product, you will solve for maybe 90% of your problem. And at that point, everything's set, right? You set the price. The people know what they're going to get. Right. And you can then transact on that. On the custom side, I'm sure there's other ways, right? You know, there's there's a, this whole kind of a configurator model has really blown up too in the right. builder, in some, some builders where it's like, here's a model. You get to configure it as you want from a custom home perspective. But the expectations are set along the way for you. It's like, you know that if you upgrade this, it's going to be X amount. I think right. that's the kind of mindset that's going to be, that's going to change the entire landscape of the industry in the next couple of years. A hundred percent. And there's, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I have it saved here. Um, but there's a, I've been following this company that is basically doing that with architecture and I, I'll, I'll find it. Um, there's a couple. I think, yeah. I think, it's, I think it's an arc. I think I want to say it's in Australia actually. Um, but they're basically packaging these like, pre-designed homes and it's like you're in 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 doing it where it's like you can basically buy this or if you want a, a a version of this we can build give you the team in order to execute upon that and it's it is it's you know look at i was having a conversation the other day about carvana it's like who who thought that you would buy a car online and the thing would show up in my driveway and it's that to me like i'll I'll never forget two year, two three years ago. I ordered, um, we bought another work van, and you go into the dealer and you haggle and you. I spent all day there. I buy the van, and I needed a second van. And I and I texted the guy I bought it off. I'm like, listen, I'll pay the same exact price I paid last time. I need another van. He's like, no problem. He's like, you want to come in? I'm like, no, I don't. He's like, all right, can I deliver the? Can I bring the van to you and you just sign the paperwork when I get there? I'm like, one hundred percent. 
I get a check and you'll, you'll show up and, and, and that, like that process, I was, I was blown away. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, Carvana. And I'm like, this is like every, you're selling time. You're selling time back to people by like not having to go to the dealership. You do everything online and one, like housing, the housing industry, there's so many, there's so many avenues right now that people are taking boxable is this company that is flat packing homes delivering them, standing them up and it's a house. And it's like that, like, that's a great opportunity. It could solve this, the, the issue for the how uh, for, you know, uh, a lesser expensive house and doing it at, at scale in a factory and, you know, and bringing that to custom homes there, there is there, you know, the configurated model. I just, I met with a company that's starting that they're matterporting existing spaces and then giving you the opportunity to go in there and give you 160 different options of what you want to do with this space for remodel. And it's like, I'm, wa- I'm, I'm like, this is brilliant. And it, you commit to it. It spits out the drawing. I can send it to my shop. We can build the cabinetry and we're on site. And it's, you know, and, and we're selling, we're selling time to the client. We're selling time to the architect. We're selling time back to the builder. And it is, it's that, that is the direction our industry is going. And, you know, I think big picture, yes, I want to build super elaborate, super custom homes. And, you know, and I, I want something I've been communicating recently is I want to do that all over the world. I want to figure out a way to build what, you know, a model where I get to travel anywhere in the entire world and build, you know, the coolest homes ever. And I think, and I, and I'm jealous of the architect world where you guys get to design homes that can be wherever where it's like, how do we figure out how to do that as a, as a builder? And maybe I just become this builder consultant where I'm just part of the process to make sure that it's executed at a particular level. I don't know. But the other side of it is I also want to give back to the housing industry and in general and, and humanity and take what I learned like Benson Wood has. And they started Unity Homes where it's he's taken everything he's learned from building custom homes and packaged it into a less expensive pre-manufactured home. That's super smart. And it's, and, and he's hitting both markets, the expensive market and the, you know, cause the vast majority of people that are building homes will never work with an architect. Never. They'll never even be an architect involved with their, their pro their project. And that's just the majority of people, but you know, and, and those people, that doesn't mean that they don't deserve a quality home. It doesn't mean that they deserve a home that, you know, is, has a 15 year life expectancy. There should be a product that, to fulfill that. Everyone's, you're always going to sell Toyota Corollas. You know, that's always going to be a car that sells, you know, far more than a, a, a Ferrari, but you're mm-hmm. going to have both sides of it. And you need to, and you need to fulfill the, the needs for both, both markets. Uh, it's been great. This has been really awesome, Nick. We have a couple questions now. I think we can transition to the audience. We've collected a couple here. Yeah, sure. Um, they're kind of they're gonna run the gamut of like different topics, so we'll try to tackle them as they sure. come. So, um, now that you have so much more experience than uh, those early seven dollar an hour days, uh, how do you price your own versus your employees' hourly rate to your clients? Don't have to talk about exact numbers, but more percentage of our rate for employee. If you if you paid your leaf carpenter fifty per hour, for example, do you double that? Like basically more on like the labor cost. Like how yeah, do you sure. map that out? So a couple of things real quick. I wanted to, we didn't touch on it, but culture and, um, you know, treating employees fairly is super important to me. So we offer really, you know, I offer retirement, medical, family medical. Um, uh, we have the week, be, the time between Christmas and New Year's paid mandatory vacation. The whole company shuts down the week around July 4th, paid mandatory vacation for the whole company, accrued vacation on top of that, where they can take any time that they want um, you know, company vehicles and, you know, just, I want to make sure that my, my employees are treated in a way that they, it's not all about work. With all of that said, there's a cost to all of that. There's a cost to having three plus weeks worth of vacation for an employee. There's a cost to the, the 401k and the health. So from an hourly rate perspective, I actually worked with, um, my, my accountant and we built a labor burden sheet. So the labor burden is literally every single cost. And I can go in there and say, all right, this, this is a carpenter 
He's been here six months, so he, ha he has the ability to have 401k. He gets full health insurance. He's got a company cell phone. He's got a company vehicle. And I basically attributed what that cost is. So a company vehicle is easy. I pay X amount a year for that vehicle. And then I pay, pay for the insurance and then averaged out. If I have 10 vehicles and my, 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 my average fuel cost for the year is $100,000, okay, $10,000 is attributed to that vehicle and divided that out. Okay, that works out to $37.50 an hour for that vehicle to be had by NS Builders divided by 2,080 hours, which is 40 hours times 52 weeks. So I do that for every single role. And, you know, that way I know exactly what that person costs for every hour that they work. And, it, and that was something that I only put into place probably a year and a half ago, where I really wanted to start understanding like truly what that, uh, th their cost was. So with that being said, you know, I find out where their rate is and then I cluster them. So an apprentice carpenter might make, you know, uh, between 15 and $22 an hour. And there's that range. So I need to bill out, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to add a small markup to that. So if, if, if they, you know, if my cost is like $38, maybe I bill out an apprentice carpenter at $45 an hour, something like, you know, just using that for example. Same thing. I'm, I'm looking at it as the, the higher end of an apprentice. And the reason that I do that is because the guy that I'm paying $15 an hour as an apprentice, the other $7 buffer, right? I basically take that and, you know, I'm, I'm making $7 more an hour on it because I'm billing them out at the higher rate. But that $7 is being attributed to the teaching cost where he's going to make mistakes. He's going to need a lot of learning. He's, I, we need to kind of walk him through things. So that extra buffer is basically the ability to teach as he slides up that scale and he's up towards $22 an hour. He shouldn't need to be like, he should be performing at an apprentice, like an apprentice level that doesn't need the additional coaching. So that, that, that buffer isn't really a formulated um, amount, but it's just in my mind, it's pre you bill at the higher amount and then the fluff as they're at the lower, they have the ability to grow into it but there's, there's money in there to help cover the cost of teaching my, my time. I remain, I'm, I'm completely overhead. So, um, car carpenters and supers are hundred percent billed to the project. Project managers are divided, uh, they're a portion to each of their projects and then a portion back to pre-construction. Um, and then the director and myself are, uh, and, and yeah, director and myself are, are, uh, overhead, Project admin is usually divided up per project. Amazing breakdown. Amazing. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, how are costs of lumber among other cost hikes resulting in your current projects? Is this impacting you? Are you reaching out to your clients for this and, you know, probably, you know, letting them give, giving them a heads up. Has this helped you shape the way you do business or what, what do you take away from this whole situation that we're in on the pricing side? really difficult for me to, to, to really know how to answer that. Um, it, you know, it really hasn't impacted a lot of our clients. It, you know, we thought it would, people would stop building, but it's, you know, I can't tell them to hold off because I don't know if it's going to go down, you know, it maybe what if it goes up and then I'm in a position where I told them to stop. Um, so I don't really, the, the lumber thing is difficult. It's definitely a conversation that we're having. Um, you know, most of our projects have been cost plus. Um, if we were in a fixed fee, if we were in a fixed uh, cost scenario, we would have language in our contract stating that, you know, fluctuating lumber prices would be, you know, responsibility of the homeowner, um, protecting ourselves from situations like this. It's unfortunate, but, you know, it's also unfortunate that the majority of the time the builder is taking the hit where, you know, it's unfair for the builder to take that hit. And, you know, frankly, it's not fair for the homeowner to take the hit, but it's, I think it's a little bit, it's, it's less fair for the builder because the builder has no control and they're genuinely trying to get the project done. And for them to take less of a, uh, a profit on the project because lumber went up is just, it's just not a fair business practice. Hmm. Would you ever consider building partial home remodels or, and or custom cabinetry like vanities or full kitchens for another contractor? friends or not, if no, why, 
If yes, how would you let go of what the final product end up, ended up looking like? Meaning, is everything you want to create uh, needs to be the needs to have your name on it, or do you care about just great quality of going out there and helping raise the bar in any way for other folks? Um, right now, we have decided to keep that all in house. There is there is a, a scenario in uh, Ken and my mind that we do sell product. Um, and I think that there is, you know, it would, it will come in time as we grow with bandwidth and uh, additional cabinet makers. Um, but it's, it's something that's not super high focus for us because our high focus is really about our brand, our, you know, our projects, our product, um, and really supporting that. And it's, you know, to answer the question about whether or not we care to have our name on it, I think if we were to approach this and sell to another builder, we would probably do it in a, you know, maybe an off brand or, you know, an unbranded product where it's like, Hey, yeah, we'll help you out by giving you quality stuff, but we don't need the, we don't need the promotional aspect of it. Um, you know, or, or we, or we decide that we want, we want to open a whole business helping other builders and then we brand it, you know, we, we create a new brand for that. Nick, I want to make sure that we have some time to talk about like the work that you do as an interviewer yourself. Uh, you've got an excellent podcast. What are some highlights? Like what are, what are some of the, what's like the best interview? What are some of the craziest stories that you've, uh, you've come across over like basically around 200 interviews. So first off, I've never thought about the fact that I've interviewed that many people um, or been part of an interview. When you said it earlier, I was like, that is pretty interesting that I've, it, that I've had the ability to interview that many people uh, in, in our industry. Um, you know, what it really comes down to is that it, it, it makes you realize I think the biggest thing in our industry, and I only, I only say that because this is the only industry I've ever known, but everyone feels so alone and there are some really dark times, um, stress, you know, I, I think there's an unnecessary amount of stress in our industry. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, um, self-inflicted or not, you know, client expectations, client, you know, client relationships. I mean, I've heard some really dark stories and, and, and when I hear them, whether or not I've, you know, been in that position or not, I feel it. I feel as though I've been there. I've been to the point where it, you know, I've wanted to give it up or that I felt as though I was inferior and, you know, it would be better if I just walked away or disappeared, you know, and, and, and there's been those dark times where it's, you know, it, that's, it's tough to hear but no one's talking about it. And, you know, and especially nowadays where everything is so in your face when it's like, I don't want people to think that we have our stuff, you know, together. I, we said on the phone call the other night, Chris, is that, you know, yeah, we're executing at a high level and we get to work on these great projects and, you know, we, we must work with great architects and it must be awesome to always, you know, nail the detail. It comes with an enormous amount of stress and, you know, and costs. It's not, it's not as, um, it's not as, you know, great all the time as it looks like. And, and, and people oftentimes, you know, forget that where it's like, you know, oh, he's, you know, when you see someone on vacation, it's like, man, be nice to be on vacation. It's like, yeah, but do you like, is he having fun? Is he, did he, did, can he actually afford that? Is he actually happy? Like, there's just so much more that you don't know. Um, and having conversations with people that are in the industry and that have struggled. And I think the best stories that we've heard are people that have dug themselves out of the ditch, whether it was 2008 and they, they came back and, and came back stronger, um, you know, and just hearing the stories of, you know, the, the tenacity that people have and just like really focused on growing through the hard times and using the hard times as a learning opportunity rather than giving up um, is, is inspiring because, you know, just like it is to be mediocre, it's really easy to give up. You know, it's, it, it, it is, it's like, it would be easier for me to 
you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to go work for someone. This isn't worth my time. You know, I'm stressed out, but you know, when you're able to find that balance and able to find that, um, that joy in what you do, you know, you, you, you need to hold on to that. And I'm actually reading a Harvard, Harvard business review book about leadership right now. And in it, it, you know, it talks about leadership and how, you know, leaders should focus on opportunities and not problems. And I, I read that I'm like, man, I, it, you know, and it goes on to explain like problems need to be addressed. You can't ignore them. But when you, when you focus all of your energy to problems, you find yourself depressed. You find yourself like just bogged down by the fact that a client won't pay you. When you're, when you're ignoring the fact that you have four clients that can't wait to pay you to build their dream house. And, you know, and hearing those stories, you know, that, that relate back to what I'm doing, um, have been great. And, and we hear all the feedback when, you know, when we get real on the podcast about struggles, you know, that's when people really reach out and say, I really appreciate that. You know, it's, it's difficult to think that, you know, you guys are crushing it and it's, it's nothing but great greatness when the reality is it's, it's not, it's you guys struggle with the same thing I do. And to hear you guys work through it makes me feel, you know, I feel inspired to, to work through it as well. Yeah. I have to say that's one of the things I do appreciate about the podcast too, is it, fe- it always feels like it's just a conversation of trying to figure something out. It always sounds like, uh, I mean, I was listening to the, the podcast where it was about pre-construction. Yep. A recent one. And, you know, you guys went through a lot of conversations back and forth about uh, this, this question of when should you be brought in to help for pricing Mm -hmm. and should it be a retainer? And is it not a retainer? Like, and like pushing each other back and forth on that. And just kind of like, there's an honest uh, kind of rawness to the conversation, honesty to it. That is, is great. It's, it's refreshing to hear. And uh, I think in, in, in this same vein, I want to ask the final question that I ask uh, all of our guests uh, that come on, which is, um, what is the nicest thing anyone's ever done for you? Wow. Um, do people know, know how to answer that? <laughs> they don't. I mean, they, they, they go everywhere. Uh, it's, it's, it's always a really, it's a powerful question. What is the nicest thing that anyone has ever done for me? I, I feel like I can go in totally like all these different directions. Um, but I would, I'm going to give this one to my wife. And I would say that she, she let me do it. She let me do my thing and, and believed in me. Um, challenged the hell out of me, made it, made it super difficult, but always, at the end of the day, always supported me. Um, and really, you know, I think shaped who I am as a man in a lot of ways, uh, today. And I think, I think it was you, Chris, I told, uh, you know, I wasn't someone, someone commented that I was really good at speaking on one of my Q and A's. And I'm like, you should have heard the accent I had three, four years ago. It was, you know, I just, I didn't, I was not a good speaker. And I, you know, I thought about, I told my wife, I'm like, that was you, you know, you, you made me really perfect who I, I, I wanted to, to be. So yeah, I'll give that one to my wife. Yeah, that's great, Nick. That's awesome to hear. Um, that's a really beautiful way to end it. So uh, I just want to give a, a quick shout out and a little blurb about Monograph before we wrap up here for everyone. So um, at Monograph, we're building the future of practice operations and back office management for small to medium-sized architecture firms. Uh, We're designed by architects for architects. So a lot of us have worked in the industry. I myself uh, have a degree in landscape architecture and architecture, both professional. Uh, Chris has also uh, uh, been trained in architecture as well and have worked at different firms. So we're building a solution that we wish we would have seen uh, during our time. Um, Firm owners, operation leaders, project managers, and office managers all use Monograph to be able to understand the real-time health, financial health of their business. And so it helps you understand where you are in any given project, what your schedules, budgets look like. Um, We have something called the Money Gantt, which is basically right on top of a Gantt chart. You can see it today, am I on track or off track for this project? 
based off of the time that people are inputting uh, in their timesheets. So it's a great way to actually see a unifying vision of your firm in one easy, beautifully designed solution. Um, so I think we're going to add a, a little bit of a couple links in the uh, in the chat there. You can start a free trial today at monograph.io uh, or watch uh, a live demo. Uh, every Friday, we have one with our CEO, Robert, where he walks through the product and answers any questions that you have. Um, it's our way of being bringing humanity to, to, to the product that we're, we're, we're trying to bring to the community and also a way to get your feedback in real time to keep improving the product to be the best in the industry. So with that, Nick, thank you so much for joining us here. Amazing conversation. Chris, thank you, as always, for doing the deep dive and helping organize this. And for everyone that tuned in today to join us and for the questions, really appreciate it. Um, really great questions out there. And uh, yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Nick. Cheers. Huge Cheers. pleasure. Really appreciate Cheers. it. Yeah, this was awesome. Great conversation, man. Cheers. Talk soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care.